rise of man becoming God will culminate in whoever this Antichrist figure is will come to the very spot in Jerusalem and will set himself up as God in the temple and proclaim himself to be God. This is called the abomination of desolation. It happened in AD 70. Titus was the Roman governor uh, at that time. And when he came in and sacked Jerusalem, he slaughtered a pig on the altar. He defamed and defiled God's temple. And so this had a near fulfillment in the days of the New Testament. But it has a far fulfillment. The Antichrist will do something similar. So abomination against God. Not only will it begin with the persecution of God's people, it will go all the way up the ladder to abomination against God and who he is. And then, literally, all hell breaks loose. Because when you start touching God's people, and you start <laughs> touching God's glory and his name, that's it. And so God begins to take action. God's judgment is a feature of the last days. Again, religious deception arises as God judges because people look for spiritual answers to the things that they're seeing. And so that's the rise of false teachers to explain what is unexplainable. So false teachers arise in the latter part of the last days. And then supernatural natural disasters, real, real bad, like the sun goes black and the moon fades away, sort of like the plagues in Egypt when the river turns red with blood. All these supernatural natural disasters begin to take place under the hand of God's judgment. And then at the end of chapter 13, we have the return of Jesus Christ. When the sky splits open and what we've been doing this for finally comes to fruition. He touches down with his feet on the Mount of Olives, right where they're sitting. <laughs> I'd love to have be the slide so, slideshow in Jesus' mind as he's talking through all this, because he has the picture of all this in his mind. He's not telling this like, you know, some secondhand story. He knows all this stuff that's going to happen. Doesn't know the exact timing because he said only the Father knows. The Son doesn't even know the exact timing. It's a mystery that we don't know, but Jesus understands the seasons and the times of the Father's will. Now, what should we be like as we talk about the last days? This is a question that we do not ask. We are fascinated with the end times, but the question then becomes, what should we be like? And Jesus peppers chapter 13 with lots of interesting phrases that speak back to the disciples about their response to what they're going to be seeing. Watch out starts at the beginning of the section in chapter 5 and ends again at the end of, uh, not, verse 5, excuse me, chapter 13, and ends in verse 37 of chapter 13 with watch out. Jesus is saying, watch and watch. He bookends this whole chapter from 5 to 37 with the word watch. Now, elsewhere in scripture, watch is always with another word. Who knows that word? Watch and pray. He's not saying, watch. He's saying, watch. Not with your eyes. Watch with the eyes of your spiritual understanding. Watch in prayer and with stuff that only prayer and insight can be given to you through that by the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Ephesians chapter 1. You watch with your spiritual eyes. We are so used to watching with our physical eyes. Oh, the earthquake. Oh, the famine. Oh, I see it. I think the last days are coming. If you took how many things you watched with your physical eyes and you balanced that on a scale with how often you seek the Lord in prayer about his kingdom coming and what your holy response should be to it, what would be greater? You put most people's lives on that scale and we are so busy watching with our physical eyes, we miss everything about what the scripture says about watching and praying. Waiting and praying. Because we think of prayer as inactiveness. Well, I guess all we can do is pray. <laughs> it's like a friend of mine she used to say, well, I guess we're reduced to trusting God. Come to that. <laughs> That's 
that's how we feel about prayer. Well, I guess we can't do anything, so we might as well have a prayer meeting. Honestly, if you peel back the flesh on your head and can see in your brain, that's what your brain is thinking. We encourage people to come on a Sunday night. I don't know where everyone comes Sunday. We have 110 people there on Sunday night. We have 3,000 people in our church. We're all hyped up about the election. How much time in prayer have we spent over this? As opposed to how much conversation, mythology, wrong information, sarcasm, hatred, and anger have been spouted out about it to each other and to other people about it. Someone once said discernment is the call to intercession, not complaining. Discernment is the call to intercession, not complaining. If God gives you insight about one person's candidacy and another person's, then he's calling you to drop to your knees and pray. He's not calling you to email 17 of your friends with the latest website and say, see who the... Discernment is the call to intercession. Watch and pray. Watch is not essentially a physical activity. Watching is a spiritual pursuit of God's kingdom as it comes. And God's kingdom as it comes is a spiritual pursuit. It will have a visible reality in the last days of the last days. But God works underground, just like the wintertime. All the stuff is happening underground, and all of a sudden in the spring, bing, comes up. Watch with your spiritual eyes. He not only says watch out, he says three times, be on your guard, be on your guard, be on your guard. Be on your guard. What do you think he means by that? It's a bad shirt to have a microphone on. I think he means in the Greek, be on your guard. Is that exactly what he means? <laughs> I'm sure John MacArthur has a very fancy discussion about what be on your guard means, but I think it means exactly that. Be awake. Be alert. Be sober, it says in other places in the New Testament. Doesn't mean not drunk, it just means sober-minded. Doesn't mean you don't cut a joke now and then have fun. It does mean you take God's things seriously. If spiritual realities that belong to God are more real than the realities that we see, that means we take spiritual realities more seriously than our actual things in our lives. Corinthians says it this way. The things which are seen are temporary. The things which are unseen are eternal. Where should your values be? In the things that are unseen. Unseen things. Spiritual things. Things that can only be accessed by the Spirit of God, usually through the venue of prayer and scripture reading. These are the important things. These are the eternal things. These are the things that will last. These are the things that build into you. But most of our focus goes to the seen things. I know this because I just moved into a house and all my focus is on the things that can be seen. And all the dirty boxes and everything are behind closed doors. But I put everything out that can be seen. Nice things. Put them all out so they look nice. Because we are people of the seen. And God has to transform us into people who value the unseen eternal things. Not only that, he says stand firm. He says this in Ephesians chapter 6 when he's talking about spiritual warfare. But he just says stand firm. And it's interesting. Who was up on the mountain with him? Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Who denies him at the end of chapter 14? He has just said, 